from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to our first ever District of Literature celebration. Very exciting, I know, cheers to you. You are, you are the, the hardcore early morning stalwarts of, of uh, poetry and fiction here in the district. Uh, my name is Rob Casper. I am the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress, and I'm thrilled to welcome you here. Um, Hopefully you all have programs uh, for today. They were uh, just a little bit late in arriving. They're actually out front, so if you don't have them, they're nice little booklets that explain all the events that are going on today. We have a number of panels and readings here at the library in this room, and then this afternoon uh, we'll break, and then this evening we're going to have uh, a couple of wonderful events at the Church of the Reformation with uh, a reception, a big blowout reception um, at the Folger Sixper Library. Uh, I'm happy to be here today with my two great collaborators, uh, Emma Snyder of Penn Faulkner and uh, Terry Cross Davis of the Folger Shakespeare Library. We've spent a lot of time in our various offices trying to figure out how to make this thing work over the, the past uh, few years, so I'm excited to actually be up here uh, uh, kicking things off. Um, but it wouldn't be right for me to do it by myself, so afterwards I'm going to ask Emma to come up, who will ask Terry to come up, and Terry will uh, introduce uh, our Poet Laureate of DC, uh, Dolores Kendrick. Uh, I'm very, very proud of, of the work we've done together, and I also want to make a shout out to one other person, Michael Collier. Uh, three years ago when I started this job, um, I talked to Michael about uh, uh, finding out about the DC literary scene. Uh, Michael, as you may know, um, I taught for many years at the University of Maryland. Uh, and over the course of our conversation, he talked about a regular gathering that I think took place in this very room uh, at this time of year, at the beginning of fall, welcoming uh, all of the, the um, members of the DC literary community together. And it seemed like a great way for people to meet one another who otherwise do the solitary work to promote uh, fiction and poetry. Often uh, people who don't know each other uh, or who know each other only by name. Uh, so it's my hope that uh, this festival, uh, this day-long festival, uh, will help revive that tradition uh, and that from today's readings, panels, presentations, uh, and lunches and receptions, uh, that will be formed new uh, bonds, new connections between writers, between lovers of literature here in the district, and between all of, all of us who work to uh, promote literature uh, that will hopefully strengthen our community and our country. So now please join me in welcoming Emma, Emma Snyder, who is the Executive Director of the Penn Faulkner Foundation. Um, well, good morning to you all, and as Rob said, thank you for being the, uh, the early birds of the literary community. Um, and thank you to Rob for that wonderful introduction, and to Terry and Rob both for uh, collaborating on this particular event. Um, when we got together, it was initially in, in the beautiful Poet Laureate's office upstairs, and Rob had invited Terry and I to his office and described to us this uh, meeting he'd had with Michael Collier and the idea of a day-long event that brought people together from across the district. Um, and to me and to the organization that Penn Faulkner is, this immediately resonated because from Penn Faulkner's very origins, it was only through the collaborative power of other literary organizations that we could come into being. Um, the Folger Shakespeare Library directly adjacent, which gave us a home, which gave us a stage to bring readers to meet with writers. Um, the Penn American Center in New York, uh, who so many of us work with consistently, who advocates for writers both in the district, uh, across the country, and, and throughout the world. That that idea of these networks that can um, empower individuals who, as Rob said, work alone so often, um, it, it's fundamental to our being, and it made so much sense to bring that to a wider audience and to bring uh, that sense of connection to the fore. And so that's a lot of what this day is about. It's about getting people together to have those conversations, to foment those ideas, um, of connecting these different communities across the district. 
uh, the writers who are working alone, the literary organizers and activists uh, who are seeking to bring those writers in connection, um, and so fundamentally, the readers of the district. And that's an amazing and enormous piece of what we hope to have happen today. Um, Penn Faulkner, the Library of Congress, and the Folger are all about the word and making Capitol Hill not just a place of politics, but a place of language. Um, and bringing those readers in today to meet with the writers of their district uh, is something that we hope continues on into the future. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce <laughs> Terry Cross Davis of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Terry. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us on this crisp September morning. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities for without them, this event would not be possible. And I would like to thank my two co-hosts for the day, the evening, my partners in crime for this event, Rob Casper and Emma Snyder. It has been a joy and a pleasure to work with you on this event, and I hope this will be the start of something more. I'd like to tell you a little bit about DC Poet Laureate Dolores Kendrick. A native of Washington, DC, Dolores Kendrick was appointed Poet Laureate of the District of Columbia on May 14, 1999. Ms. Kendrick is the author of the award-winning poetry book, The Women of Plums, Poems and the Voices of Slave Women published in 1989. In 1996, a CD of music inspired by the Women of Plums was released, and Ms. Kendrick adapted the book for theatrical performance in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, and at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. The adaptation won the New York Professional Award in Theater. She was the first Vera I. Hines Professor Emerita at Phillips Exeter Academy and one of the first original designers and teachers at the School Without Walls in Washington, D.C. Ms. Kendrick currently works out of the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities, and I can tell you that I've had the pleasure of working with her for eight years now with her Poets in Progress program that we host at the Folger Shakespeare Library. Please welcome D.C. Poet Laureate Dolores Kendrick. Thank you very much for that generous applause. Good morning to you all, and I'd like to thank these two people sitting in the front row for uh, the word creating. I'm gonna use that word, creating this uh, event. Uh, I heard, as someone said to me recently about someone who was the, another person who had organized some kind of uh, event. And she said to me, uh, well, it, well, this person organized it. This person is creative. I said, let's go to the dictionary and look up that word. And the word, the dictionary says, when you create, you create something out of nothing. There is nothing there, and your imagination helps you to do it. Now, don't get me started, because I'll start talking about that instead of reading you poems. But these two people are creators, and I'm very happy to work with them and uh, in this particular event. Can everybody hear me now? Okay. I was asked to read two po uh, uh, poems in relation to the District of Columbia, and uh, I got lucky, or we got lucky, because uh, when the new Dunbar High School, which many of you may know something about, has been rebuilt, and they asked me to write the poem for that celebration, and I took the, poem, uh, the idea from Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who wrote a poem called Keep a Pluggin' Away, and that poem is now in the halls of the Dunbar uh, High School, and I wrote the poem called The Pluggers. It was in the blood and bone, and the steep stair steps led to hollows of wall that witnessed the bravery of teachers 
whose students came bearing olive branches, hunger upon their mouths, delivery in their hands. It was in the blood of birth, beginnings torn from the muscle of a city that could do nothing else but welcome them. It was in the blood of pluggers anxious to sow their tender seed into the great city ground of weary philosophers who wondered now and then what it was all about. It was in the beaches of the souls of future poets, and Dunbar was that, who defied the dust of soothsayers while the sun made songs of light. It was in the blood that Charles Drew made his ancestor, where others followed plugging from a poem, spoken destiny as though it were a song. Dunbar knew that to plug is to stop a hole or gap. So the young folk came bearing a creative intelligence that mastered the mathematics of ghosts and shadows of passions of despair, while the demons fled into their thin and sour songs. Now, we honor those names that made tyrants weak. We look at the accomplishments of this school, this time, this place, and know that the pluggers praised all life wherever it took root, and smiling, moved plugging into the genesis of power. And so that I'm not cheating any, cheating my, the people who asked me to write something, read something from the city, I did find a very short poem, and it is short, because I've overstayed my time, I guess, already. But, uh, I wrote a, poem, a book called Why the Woman is Singing on the Corner, and that is about these women who have, uh, uh, I guess many of us have seen them during our lifetime. You go to New York, you see they're on the corner, they're schizophrenic, and they're screaming and whatnot. And I often thought, they must have had a life. These women must have had a life somewhere. So I wrote this book, and in this book you see this woman disintegrating as she goes along. I based it on Ophelia, who is, uh, as you know in Shakespeare's Hamlet, does lose her mind, but she loses it gradually because she cannot handle what, she's too fragile to handle the horrors that are hitting her. 14th Street has an ache in its belly. Traffic is agitated, pavements are hot. The D.C. street steams in summer sounds above a choir loft of birds comment upon the sages of the air. Pigeons practicing pole wars. I guess you know I like alliteration, huh? <laughs> Under plain driven sky, people make choices, a cab, the bus, or metro and whisper their complaints into the ear of a listening cloud. The cacophony pleases, a fe pleases Felia. Long ago, 14th Street was an avenue, wide and graceful, a trolley car track ribboning its long and graceful live, moving from uptown to the U Street corridor where people came to pay homage to a blues, a jazz, courtship, Ella, Chick Webb. Dizzy Gillespie, Cab Calloway, Billy Eckstein, Billy Holiday, the Divine, Sarah, Louis Armstrong. From U Street, the limb creaked to the narrows of downtown, carrying a slight hum, and that was all. Now the trees in aging speak stories about themselves, converse with the street, gone old and slightly bony, no longer plump, and full of honey and debris in its voice. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little introduction. Um, before I do that though, I wanna give, give a nice little shout out to the Center City Public Charter School in Trinidad on, uh, on West Virginia Avenue. Northeast, give them a round of applause for being here. 
young, young, hopefully young poets and writers in, in the making. Um, I wanted to briefly um, introduce myself. I'm Fred Joyner. I'm the curator of public programs for the American Poetry Museum. We have a website, AmericanPoetryMuseum.org. It's a, um, just really briefly, it's a museum and gallery space, uh, mostly virtually, but we partner with organizations like, uh, in the past we partnered with the Phillips Collection, with other, other, in other museums to do, to do exhibitions and events that bring together literature, lit, uh, literature and poems and show the way that poetry occurs in, in, in public life. Dr. Medina, you can come to the front. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what we do. If you're interested, I'll be here all day. <laughs> so please feel free to, to come and, and ask me questions or check out the website. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much to the Library of Congress, to Folger, uh, Terry and Rob, and, uh, and everyone who ha has anything. And to my panelists here, I wanna thank them in advance um, because it's, it's been quite a task to, to make this happen. Um, I'm just gonna go right into things here. Um, this is a panel about Sterling Brown, the first poet laureate of Washington, D.C. Um, we, can, we can have a little bit of a discussion after. Uh, we've, we've left some time for discussion after. Um, but my hope is that these, these poets and writers here will introduce you to and talk to you a little bit about Sterling's reach, um, his reach and his range. Um, and then also to give you a flavor for how he is connected to this city um, in, in a way that is, uh, that's still bearing fruit for so many of us who are poets and writers in Washington, D.C. So I'm thankful for that. Sitting immediately to my left, your right. I always wanted to say that, my left, your right, you know? <laughs> um, is A.B. Spellman. Um, I like to do these personal kind of bios. Is I, I ran into your book because my father's a musician, a trombone player. And when I was old enough to think I knew something about jazz, he gave me four bebop lives or, uh, in, the, in the bebop business, um, which later became four lives. I got the four lives version. Um, and so, and I was like, who is this guy that can write about this music and these people in this way? And it was just, it was really stunning. To, it was really stunning to me as a young person playing trombone, trying to figure out how this music has meaning and uh, real meaning in the world. Um, and then the people you picked, you can talk a little bit more about that when you get up here, but the, the jazz folks that you picked um, were really important for me because they, uh, he highlighted people that hadn't been getting, I think, the, the kind of attention. Um, sitting to his left, Shakima Smalls, a poet and educator, uh, writer and educator, here in Washington, D.C., from Georgetown, South Carolina, which is a special place to me because my people, my mom's people are coastal South Carolinians and my dad's people are co coastal Georgians uh, from Savannah. So I met Shakima uh, a while ago when working on a, a journal called the Tidal Basin Review and um, I'm happy to have her here. Um, and then to her left, um, one of, my, one of my mentors, uh, one of my uh, model uh, poets, somebody I look up to, uh, Dr. Tony Medina. I first met Dr. Medina in 1998. Um, he's the author of six, over 16 books of, 16 books of poetry. Uh, how many books for children? Four or five, four, four or five books. Of, he's also the winner of the a two time winner of the Patterson Prize for books for young people. His latest poetry book is uh, called the, the Onion of Wars. Um, it's got a beautiful cover on it. Oh no, your latest book is actually Broke. Uh, uh, yeah, is, is Broke Broke. <laughs> um, but the book that I was talking about, I'm sorry, is Onion of Wars. It's got a beautiful Jean Michel Basquiat cover. Um, there it is, he's holding it up. Um, so we'll get him to talk about his work a little bit. Um, 
So the, w the way we're going to do this, Shakima, if you would, uh, we'll have Shakima and then Dr. Medina and then, and then uh, the distinguished, our distinguished panelists here, A.B. Spellman. And then uh, if we have time, we'll have a discussion. Um, and there'll be no break in between, so we'll go straight through. Is that okay? Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. So let's go. Wait, or my, yeah. So oh, wow. please, please give Shakima Smalls a round, a round of applause as she comes. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, I have some notes on my phone, so please don't think I'm being rude. I'm actually just pretty high tech. Um, I recently started doing work, uh, research on the work and life of. Dr. Brown, and I actually didn't do a lot of extensive work while at an undergrad at Howard, but um, in reading his work now, it's brought a new perspective to my own writing because culture, especially African-American culture, Afro-diasporic cultures are very important to me in my own work. Um, so the first essay that I actually found was Dan Vera's essay that he wrote in 2012. And um, I forgot what site I found it on. But he mentioned that we make our work wherever we live. Whether we write of our environs, we make our work where we live. The streets we cross and drive, the parks we frequent, the corner stores, the neighborly exchanges, these make up the fabric of our daily lives. To think that a poet like Sterling Brown walked these same streets added a luster to what I once thought an unremarkable part of the city. And thinking of DC and the work and life of Sterling Brown, a lot of us uh, may know that Sterling Brown was born and lived near and on the campus of Howard University. So Howard University was very close to him for a great majority of his life, even for the period that he moved to Brooklyn, I believe it was, and he had a home in Brooklyn. He was still very active on campus. Um, and that was something that I thought, you know, as a Howard alum, that was pretty important, and I want to look more into that um, on my personal, in my personal time. But he came back to Howard, and he taught, I believe it was for 40 years or something like 40. that? 40. Yeah, it was, a, it was a very long time. Uh, he came back to Howard, and he taught. He was very well respected by the students at Howard. And um, a lot of people that I know, my own mentors, uh, like Ethelbert, they were students of his, Professor Spellman, um, Tony Morrison. And in doing my own research on Spellman, um, excuse me, on Sterling Brown, I found that the concentration of my research, especially in undergrad, was critical race theory. And so in bringing a new perspective to my work, I looked at his writings on blacks or the Negro in white literary imagination. And this I read after reading Toni Morrison. So this really expanded how I thought about critical race theory in terms of literature. So I had a few notes on that. Um, so you know, his work explored jazz and blues traditions and everyday life. And to refer back to what Dan Vera said about just him living in the District of Columbia and connecting that to his work, especially when you read his work, you'll see that he worked extensively in African-American dialects. Um, I think this is important because we see the, every, the everyday working man you know, of African descent in America in Sterling Brown's work. And this is something that's very relatable. It actually made me think of Medina's work because he's on the panel and he writes a lot about the everyday man, the working man, the poor man, the trials and tribulations that blacks in America have had to go through, their joys even. You know, a lot of times we forget the joys that people who are in tough situations have to, uh, that they experience in, in spite of all that. So that's one thing that I thought was very beautiful, especially about the poem that I chose, Slim in Atlanta. Down in Atlanta, the white folks got laws for to keep all the niggas from laughing outdoors. Hope to God I may die if I ain't speaking the truth. Make the niggas do their laughing in a telephone booth. Slim Greer hit the town and the Rebs got him told, don't you laugh on the street if you want to die old. Then they showed him the booth in a hundred shrines and a hundred shines in front of it, waiting in double lines. Slim thought his sides would bust in two, yelled, look out everybody, I'm coming through. Pulled the other man out and bust in the box, 
and laughed for hours by the Georgia clocks. Then he peeked through the door, and what did he see? 300 niggas there in misery, some holding their sides, some holding their jaws to keep from breaking the Georgia laws. And Slim gave a holler and started again. And from 300 th throats came a moan of pain. And every time Slim saw what was outside, he got to whooping again till he nearly died. And while the poor critters was waiting their chance, Slim laughed till they sent for the ambulance. The state paid the railroad to take him away. Then things was as usual in Atlanta, GA. <laughs> Broke, right? So if any yeah. of you have ever read Medina's work, he has a character named Broke that is a rather flushed out character, a rather flushed out every man kind of character. He was the character that I thought of when I read Slim in Atlanta. There's a series of Slim poems in Brown's works. Um, and so you see in documenting the struggles of the everyday man here, you can even find humor in it. You know, he finds humor in it. And if you read the work, you know, the way that I, I naturally speak, because I'm Gullah Geechee from South Carolina, is very similar to this, even though African American dialects vary. Um, so it's, it's very natural, but when you read it, it's kind of odd, especially if you're trained in written English. But he did very well with it, you know, and in reading dialect before him, I, I don't know of many other artists, poets, who've done it so well. So I thought that was a beautiful thing. Um, I also thought of Elaine Locke, um, and I wanted, in, in looking at the work of Lane, Elaine Locke during the Harlem Renaissance and looking at the work of Sterling Brown, I, I sometimes wonder about the distinction between folk art and high art. And so, you know, I, I wanted to know if any of the other panelists could kind of, um, you know, elaborate upon Sterling Brown's approach to we'll, we'll the distinction there. between folk and high in, art. In our discussion, we'll get there. Yeah. Hopefully. So I'm, I'm done with, with my reading now, so. Don't you want to share one of your poems? Are we reading our poems? Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Read I your didn't. poem. Okay. I wasn't aware. Um. Breathe. It's okay. <laughs> we love you. I love me, too. Thank you. But, but say hi to the kids over here. Hi, kids. <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause right here, everybody. This is untitled. Culottes. My grandmother pulls them from her closet. She is considering her midsection and praising his name. Center church, squeezed inside buttons and fabric tinsel. She's breathing hard now trying to weigh the burden of pain, three inches of plastic between her heels and hell, and girdling, culotte casual, casual, too much so, she decides against it, favoring heels and hallelujah, hallelujah bleached usher woman triumph, over constricted, don't hallelujah too loud waistbands. She is going to be redeemed today, and when we return home, I'll soak her feet, thanking God, for her soft waist, all both of them. Thank you, thank you, Shakima and uh, Dr. Medina. It's good to be here, thank you. I'm glad that um, I'm here. Thanks, Fred, thanks, um, Terry, and everybody involved with the District of Literature. It's good to be here with my former student, Shakima Smalls and um, a legendary figure, A.B. Spellman. And I'm excited about the conversation because I want to hear his take on his teacher, uh, Sterling Brown. Whenever you hear the name of Langston Hughes, you should always think of Sterling A. Brown as well. The fact that we don't is a shame on us, OK? But um, like Shakima said earlier about this whole Slim character, that uh, Slim Greer, that uh, Sterling created, much like Langston Simple or Richard Pryor's Mudbone. Uh, he was a very uh, folkloric, urban type of uh, wild cat, right? Mm -hmm. That didn't take any stuff. And reading Sterling Brown is fascinating because 
you know, with my own work, I invented a character some years back called Broke. He's a homeless everyman, uh, which I like to share a couple of those poems, or something from Broke. A homeless everyman who's talking about his life through poetry. This is from the latest collection called Broke Baroque. It's called Broke for Beginners. I used to moonlight as moonshine. Now I moonlight as moonlight. My kicks were out of sight. Now they are out of sight. Snatched off by some punks playing a practical joke or some jailhouse freak selling them back to me for smokes. Better not catch no sewer rat rocking them. End up dried out, crunchy, crisp, and tased on the third rail. How my hair wound up a bird's nest is anybody's guess. Drugs, war, poverty, despair, who cares when one has bigger problems like worrying about food to eat with no fish to fry? In the beginning was the hunger and the wail. Then came Cain, disenable, murder, death, sin, blues, and taxes. Absent father gone to get a pack. Angry mother and emotional ransack. Prison guards in jail. The deck is stacked. Like I said, it's a fact. I used to moonlight as moonshine, carefree as light crinkling on water. Now I moonlight as midnight, humping trash cans for what's discarded without no son or daughter. I forgot to break out the fly uh, specs. <laughs> so I could look like my man right here in the front row. All right. Um, you know, um, Sterling was a bluesologist of the highest order. And so I want to write, I want to read one of my blues poems. It's called Bipolar Blues. Ever love a woman, you love her too damn much. Ever love a woman so mean, you give her flowers, candies, and such and such. She pay you back with a switchblade to your gut. I know it might sound violent, it might sound extreme, but did you ever love a woman oh so mean? Breath carnation, milk sweet, but what come out of her nostrils is steam. Ever love a woman who flips just like a switch? One minute she's batting her lashes, smiling. The next minute she got you lying in a ditch. I got an on and off woman who loves me on and off. One minute she says I love you. The next minute she scowls and scoffs. For my birthday she gave me a bottle of my favorite gin. Said she gave me a big old bottle of sweet down home sin and gin heavy as lead, then got to drinking, and thinking, and blinking, and bashed it over my head. Went to the doctor to work on her head, went to the doctor to fix what's broke in her head. Old doc ended up mending mine instead. This piece that I'm, this, this last uh, piece of mine that I'm going to read is about the, uh, you heard about the bonobo monkeys? The primates? Well, they're kind of like, well, um, they share like about 90, 98.9% .9 of our genetic makeup, and they exist in the Congo. Um, they're separated by a river from like chimpanzees and all the other primates and stuff like that. Um, they eat this, this fruit uh, called jungle sop that's supposed to be really delicious or whatever. They're very intelligent. And um, close your ears over here, this whole section. Just cover your ears real quick. Just cover them real, yeah, everybody. All of y'all, cover your ears. They're highly sexualized and they have more uh, sexual positions than the Kama Sutra, right? <laughs> So, um, uh, <laughs> and they're, they're, they're led by a matrilineal line. So the women are the, 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 
the, they're holding it down. They're the heads of the household and stuff like that. Um, so this is broke, you know, as one of the primates on the other side of the river talking about his old lady. Um, and I mentioned, uh, instead of saying the Kama Sutra, in here, Broke calls it the Karma Sutra. Broke Bonobo. We were separated by a river. She was busy and wouldn't even give me a sliver of banana peel. Although I appealed to her sense of matriarchy, I said, cut the malarkey, give me a piece of that nana. It's not like I'm asking for much or manna by Jiminy. It's hard out here for a chimp. In the jungle with no chimney, swinging from branch to branch, defending your honor, she said, do me a solid, babe, and fetch me some jungle sop. <laughs> to which I snorted and plodded and clopped about to make her happy. We spent that night wearing out our copy of the Karma Sutra, bending branches, shaming leaves. At one point, I caught a draft and sneezed blowing the whole damn thing. All I wanted to do was sing, let her in on what I was feeling, but she was no longer in the mood, and I tried not to brood. Besides, the moon hung so low, I climbed up on its crescent and spent the night in the crook of its glow while she snored and snored, talking about me in her sleep, sucking her teeth, mumbling, this mother freaky. <laughs> I had to clean up the language. <laughs> I had to clean up the language for the kids, you know what I'm saying? All right, this is the, I want to read uh, this piece of Sterling Brown's poetry. This really reminds me of Obama and his relationship to the Republican Party in Congress. It's called Slim in Hell. It's in three parts, but I'm not going to read section it out. Slim Greer went to heaven. St. Peter said, Slim, you've been a right good boy. And he, he winked at him. You've been a traveling rascal in your day. You can, you can roam once more, then you comes to stay. But these wings on your shoulders and save your feet. Slim grinned and he speak up, thank you, Pete. Then Peter say, go to hell and see all that it's doing and report to me. Be sure to remember how everything go. Slim say, I'll be seeing you on the late watch, Bo. Slim got to cavorting, swell as you choose, like Lindy in the spirit of St. Louis blues. He flew and he flew till at last he hit a hangar with, sign, with the sign reading, this is it. Then he parked his wings and strolled around, getting used to his feet on the solid ground. Big bloodhound came a-roaring like Niagara Falls, sicked on by white devils in overalls. Now slim, worn, scared, crossed my heart, it's a fact, and the dog went on baying some poor devil's track. Then slim saw a mansion and walked right in. The devil looked up with a sickly grin. Suddenly didn't look for, for you, Mr. Greer, how it happened you comes to visit here. Slim say, oh, just thought I'd drop by a spell, feel at home, saying here's the keys to hell. Then he took Slim around and showed him people raising hell as high as the first church steeple. Lots of folks fighting at the roulette wheel, like old Rampart Street, old Leetwise Bill. Showed him bawdy houses and cabarets, slim thought of New Orleans and Memphis days. Each devil was busy with a devilish broad, and slim cried, Lordy, Lord, Lord, Lord. Took him in a room where slim see the preacher with a brown skin on each knee. Showed him giant stills going everywhere with a passel of devils, stretched dead drunk there. Then he took him to the furnace that some devils was firing, hot as hell, and Slim start a mean perspiring. 
White devils with pitchforks threw black devils on. Slim thought he'd better be getting along. And he say, this makes me think of home. Vicksburg, Little Rock, Jackson, Waco, and Rome. Then the devil gave Slim the big ha-ha and turned into a cracker with a sheriff's star. Slim ran for his wings, lit out from the ground, hauled it back to St. Peter, safety bound. St. Peter said, well, you got back quick. How's the devil? And what's his latest trick? And Slim say, Peter, I really can't tell. The place was Dixie that I took for hell. Then Peter say, you must be crazy, I vow. Where in hell did you think hell was anyhow? <laughs> Get on back to the earth, cause I got the fear you's a little too dumb for to stay up here. I just want to close out with this last Sterling Brown poem. Um, outside of the one that he read about his wife and used to break down and cry all the time in his readings, this is probably one of his favorite. It's called After Winter. <clears throat> he snuggles his fingers in the black or loam, the lean months are dawn with, the fat to come. His eyes are set on a brushwood fire but his heart is soaring higher and higher. Though he stands ragged in old scarecrow, this is the way his swift thoughts go. Butter beans for Clara, sugar corn for Grace, and for the little fella running space. Radishes and lettuce, eggplants and beets, turnips for the winter and candied sweets, homespun tobacco, apples in the bin, for smoking and for cider when the folks draps in. He thinks with the winter his troubles are gone, 10 acres unplanted to raise dreams on. The lean months are done with the fat to come, his hopes, winter wanderers, has and home, butter beans for Clara, sugar corn for Grace, and for the little fella running space. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Medina. I wanted to, just before we get to uh, Professor Spellman, I, I wanted to say that there's, in your program, you'll see that there's a little note there about the, there's a documentary that Holly Garima, the filmmaker Holly Garima at Howard University made about Sterling Brown. He worked on it with some students, and I believe you can get it at, you can get access to it at, at Howard University. Um, it's a beautiful piece. Um, and uh, for those of us who, who, uh, who relish in Sterling, um, it's, it's definitely a treat, something that you uh, would want to check out. Um, so I just wanted to make that note if any of you hadn't gotten the program or hadn't seen it. So if you would, Professor Spellman. Thank you. First of all, hold up. Is this working? Yes. I'm good? Okay. First of all, I'm really no professor at all. I haven't taught in a good 35 years, so, <laughs> so um, I'm just a poor boy from North Carolina trying to make it up here in the city, you know. <laughs> um, yes, I went to Howard University in 1952. Yes, I said 1952, uh, a very long time ago. That was in the days before, it was two years before Brown versus Board. And I had grown up in the Jim Crow South, uh, this is an age when racism was unapologetic. It was in your face. There were signs everywhere to tell you about it. And it was enforced and taught in the schools, taught in the homes, taught in the churches. Uh, Jim Crow was pervasive. It was, the worst part probably was mental because you thought growing up in North Carolina as I did, that that was the way the world was. Uh, also, I want to make the point that, um, and that because of Jim Crow, Howard University had, um, paradoxically, a brilliant faculty because black intellectuals had nowhere else to go except for historically black schools. And Howard and Fisk and Atlanta University Center, Lincoln, Pennsylvania, uh, were, among, were the elite black schools. 
And uh, so when I got to Howard, we had a faculty. I took had classes from history classes from John Hope Franklin, sociology classes from, um, um, oh, I hate these moments. <laughs> e. Franklin Frazier, thank you very much. Um, I had, um, and I had uh, classes in, in, in theater from uh, Owen Dotson and um, classes in literature from Sterling Brown. Um, I wish that I had more discipline um, because I, I, I tell these young people here right now, go to the hardest schools you can go to. You don't, you're not going to believe me and you're going to try not to do it, but it's the best thing for you. Go to the, I did not. Such hard schools were not available to me in North Carolina, so I had no, no study habits, none of that. So I wasted a lot of these professors. Um, uh, John Hope Franklin was helping the NAACP legal defense team prepare the case for Brown versus Board. He would go and talk to these lawyers about how, what the historical background was for Dred Scott, et cetera, and then he'd come in and tell us in class about it. And I wish I had had, had, had the discipline to take better advantage of that kind of thing. Um, and Sterling Brown was a man I should have used more. We had a little writer's group. Uh, Louis, Lucille Clifton is a person many of you might know, whose work many of you might know who was in that group. And we didn't know how to have a writer's workshop because none of us had ever been to it. So we didn't know that what you should do is invite somebody like Sterling Brown to help you out with it. And he would have done it because he was a very, very generous professor and was very glad to see some young Howard students writing. This was not a time when things like literature and art and serious music were thought very highly of um, among young students. People were thinking really about acquiring degrees that would allow them to become as deeply into the middle class as their lives could go. So, um, so I didn't take good advantage of it, but he, but he was a very generous, a very wise, a very soft-spoken uh, intellectual. He was very, a very plain-speaking man, and you had to listen hard to hear how deep his mind was, because otherwise he had a gift of putting complex ideas so simply that you wouldn't know that they were complex uh, until you thought back on them and you go, oh wow, I can, I can, I can ruminate on this for many hours, uh, so it was. Um, I came to see Sterling Brown again in plus or minus 1970. At this time, I was, uh, I was writer in residence or visiting lecturer at, at, at a couple of colleges and uh, he had kept up with my career, so I mean, uh, about 15 years had passed since I was a student of his, and I was amazed that he remembered me, remembered my name, and said, you're obviously a very hardworking intellectual these days. You did not work like that when you took my classes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was quite an embarrassment. Uh, yeah, we went over to his house, and, 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 and it was a, a, a wonderful kind of a soiree that, uh, that evening. Um, he had a very uh, clear sense of how the evening was supposed to go. He said, first, we're going to listen to some music, and then we're going to have some drinks, and then we'll have some conversation. And so he put on some Duke Ellington. And he turned to me and said, Spellman, you young guys know all about the contemporary music, but you don't know the classics. Well, I proceeded to name the entire Ellington trumpet section by chair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I started on the saxophone section. He said, okay, 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 you've earned a drink. Uh, uh, but, that, but, I, but I remember that, that particular little uh, sort of friendly confrontation there. And then uh, over drinks, he started telling these really wild stories. He greatly admired what were called lies. Uh, if you've ever read Zora Hurston's of Mules and Men, that was called in the community, that was called lies. It wasn't called folklore. And, and Sterling Brown loved that stuff. Um, and um, uh, you know, even the Uncle Remus stories, for example. Um, Sterling Brown loved that stuff, and he, and, and he loved to participate. And so he started telling these lies. And uh, the one that I remember most, I just remember the punchline of it was a long, I remember him starting out saying, that there was no Harlem Renaissance. It was, that was just a bunch of Negroes following Carl Van Vexen around looking for parties. 
Uh, I mean, I don't, he, I don't think he meant it quite that way, but he was, uh, <laughs> but it, there was a little, a little dig in there for it. But then he saw this, this whole elaborate uh, story went on and on and on, and it was hilarious and long, and he ended with a punchline uh, about some German woman shooting W.B. Du Bois in the butt with a, with a 32 pistol. Now, again, it was, it was complete fabrication, uh, but, it, but it was a very funny and also kind of historic in a way because there was a lot of historical truth in the way that the story evolved. I wish, I wish we could have recorded that one that was completely improvised, uh, and this kind, of, um, this kind of talk was something that he was very, very good at. A very good and wise man. Uh, I, um, I admired him greatly. Uh, during the 1960s, when we were uh, first getting the black arts movement going, um, a lot of us who had, who had been engaged in the New York literature, literary scene um, before the, we, we came to, before Martin King and Malcolm X and others sort of lifted our consciousness, um, we were largely engaged in trying to develop work that, uh, along traditional literary, traditional contemporary literary lines, worried about things like measure, about enjambments, about um, how you go about breaking the line, about uh, form, um, and so forth. And, um, and then all of a sudden, we were confronted with the issue of relevance, because there was this big historical thing happening in the streets. And if you had a soul at all, you wanted to be in that. And, uh, but then the question was, as, how do you go into it as an artist? Well, you don't go into it with two-dimensional work that is uh, where the eye judges the lines off the page. You go into it with work that can communicate more broadly, that can talk to audiences that are not liter literate, literary art, art audiences, but of very intelligent people with deep culture. And, um, and you had to find a way of getting that culture, going back and finding it in yourself, and having it come back through into the poem. And we needed some guides for that. And one of the, to me, the greatest guide, more than any other poet uh, of, of, of his time, was Sterling Brown. Sterling Brown, more than anybody, and to me, uh, and I would include the great Langston in this, had captured the oral tradition in poetry and managed to say serious political and social things with it at the same time as he remained true to the language and the meters and the style of the people. And uh, so, so we admired that. The poem I was originally going to read was um, the Ballad of Joe Meek because that was a poem about resistance. Uh, and it was a poem wherein a, 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 a very mild-mannered black man was seriously abused by a very brutal police department in New Orleans. And he went up and got a rifle and started shooting some. But after the Navy Yard uh, incident a couple of weeks ago, I, I didn't see that that would be a good poem to do today. Um, so I'm going to do a poem um, which is unusual for Sterling Brown because there's no humor in it. Uh, it's it's, it's a, a poem that's a little bit bitter. Uh, it's um, a poem called Caravan, and he's dealing with uh, a cabaret. Um, that is, cabarets were like brown bag clubs. You brought your own liquor, and you bought the setup in, in, when you got to the place, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and so forth. And uh, there was a show. And of course, there was a big white audience in, in, in there as well as in Chicago. And, um, and he found the um, exploitation of these women in the chorus line. The thing about the, um, in these shows, in, in the black shows, the women had to be very light skinned. The men had to be very dark skinned. So you had great, back in the burlesque days, you had great black entertainers like Burt Williams and so forth who would perform in, 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 in um, and, and blackface uh, because they were too light complected and, and that was not acceptable uh, in, in, in the nature of the time. So, um, so he, he, he uh, Sterling Brown was really offended in this poem by, by all, these, all these people sitting there leering at these women and, and it, it's suggesting that some of them uh, tried to buy them after the shows. And also he was, um, 
he thought that the music was, he thought that the music was sort of too good for the audience. And uh, so all of that comes through in this poem. It's called Caravan, 1927, black and tan, Chicago. Oh. Does anybody else besides me have trouble getting the optometrist to prescribe enough magnification in your bifocals <laughs> to be able to actually read something? <laughs> I, I can't get mine to, to, to do it. So I have to carry these CVS glasses with me. We <laughs> get through a reading. I have a magnifying glass in there too. I love this, 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 this collection. Unfortunately, I wish they'd use a larger font. All right, Cabaret. Rich, flashy, puppy-faced, Hebrew and Anglo-Saxon, the overlords sprawl here with their glittering darlings. The smoke curls thick in the, in the diminished light, surreptitiously, deaf-mute waiters flatter the grandees, going easily over the rich carpets, weary lest they kick over the bottles under the tables. The jazz band unleashes its frenzy. Now, now, to it, Roger. That's a nice doggy. Show your tricks to the good gentleman. The trombone belches and the saxophone wails uh, curdlingly. The cymbals clash. The drummer twitches in an epileptic fit. Muddy water round my feet, muddy water. The chorus always in. Course sways in the Creole beauties from New Orleans by way of Atlanta, Louisville, Washington, Yonkers, with stopovers they've used nearly all their lives. Their creamy skin flushing, uh, flushing rose warm. Oh, la be the belle. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. This is in French. Oh, les ad de belle quatrièmes. Their shapely bodies, naked cave, the tattered pink silk bodices, short velvet tights, and shining silver buckle boots. Red bandanas on their sleek and close clipped hair to bring to mind, aided by the bottles under the tables, life upon the river. Ladies, the pirate, no, Lafitte the pirate instead, and his doughty daggers of gold. There's a peace and happiness there, I declare. In Arkansas, poor, ha uh, poor half-naked fools tagged with uh, identification numbers when uh, worn out upon the, oh goodness, worn out upon the levees and carried back to the, to the serfdom they had never left before and may never leave again. Be dappy doop, be dappy doop. The girls wiggle and twist. Oh, you too, proud high stepping beauties. Show your paces to the gentleman, a prime filly. Uh, sir, what am I offered, gentlemen, gentlemen? I've been away a year today to wander in Rome. I don't care if it's muddy there. Now that the, now that the floods recede, what is there left the miserable folk? Old time and abundance to count their losses. There is so little else to be, so little else to count. Still, it's my home, sweet home. From the lovely throats, motes, and deep voices, and deep cries for home, Nashville, Toledo, Spout Springs, Boston, Creoles from Germantown, the bodies twist and rock, the glasses are filled up again. In Mississippi, the black folk um, huddle with un uncomprehending, wondering how come the good Lord could treat them this way. Shelter down in the delta. Along the Yazoo, the buzzards fly over here too, fly, fly over low, um, cluttered but with their scrawny necks shrieking. I've got my toes toward Dixie Ways. Round that delta, let me laze. The hand goes, the hand goes mad, the drummer, I'm sorry, the band goes mad, the drummer throws his sticks at the, at the moon, a paper mache moon. The chorus leaps into weird posturings. 
the form flashing orange, plucking at grapes to stain their, their, carled, uh, their carled mouths, seductive bodies weaving, bending, writhing, turning. My heart cries out for muddy water. Down in the village, down in the valleys, the stench of the drying mud uh, as, and, a, and a bitter reminder of death. Dee da da. Now, <laughs> thank you. I should have used a magnifying glass. Um, thank you. There's some things about that poem I, I, I want to comment on. First of all, it's a very modern poem. Uh, it it uh, uses, it, it, for 1927, it, this poem is a, as advanced as anything happening in American literature. It uses uh, things like, um, you notice the, the, the margins, the, the, the stanchions, the, the, the units of the poem are placed various, in various margins across the page. Uh, this is a way of distinguishing the different voices. And there's a poem that comes from many voices. There are at least four or five different voices at work in this poem. A very difficult thing to do and a very modern thing to do. He uses all of the devices of, of, of lineation, of enjambment, and so forth uh, to make this poem work. At the same time, he captures very graphically a scene. And, and, and this is, is, uh, is a hard thing to do. He captures very graphically a scene and lets you know what's wrong with this scene, even though there's a great deal of life going on in the music. So um, I admire this poem very much. I admire all these poems very much. Uh, it was a very great poem, poet. I didn't know we were doing poems, so uh, I, don't, I, didn't bring, I didn't bring any, so I'm definitely, therefore I'm restricted to poems that I know by heart. Um, so I'll apologize right away to Terry Cross Davis. I'll do a couple of poems she's heard at least twice. Um, but, well, they don't die on your poems. They don't get sick and die uh, if they're any good, and I hope these are. Um, that these are poems that I think would be cons consistent that I think uh, Mr. Brown would admire because uh, for one thing, um, one thing, one of them is a, is a poem about jazz. It's about aging, actually, but it, it deals with jazz and it's called um, Groovin' Low. Um, the hipsters in the room will know that that's a play on the, on, on the Dizzy Gillespie tune, Groovin' High. Uh, whatever Dizzy was talking about in Groovin' High, this, this poem is about getting older. Uh, the only thing to tell you about it is the weird words in the st second stanza, uh, technical terms of drumming. I didn't make them up. Okay, grooving low. My swing is more mellow these days, not the hard bop drive I used to roll, but more of a cool foxtrot. My eyes still close when the rhythm locks. I've learned to boogie with my feet on the floor. I'm still moving, still grooving, still falling in love. I bop to the bass line now, the trap set paradiddles, ratamacues, and flams that used to spin me in place still set me off. But I bop to the bass line now. I enter the tune from the bottom up and let trumpet and sax wheel above me. So, don't look for me in the treble. Don't look for me in the fly staccato splatter of the hot young horn, no. You'll find me in the nuance, hanging out, with the, hanging out in something in slur. <laughs> I'm the one executing the half-bent dip and the slow, slow drag with the smug little smile and the really cool shades. Uh, so getting older doesn't have to be about falling apart. Um, all right, the other, the other poem also, not, uh, not, too, not too long, it's called After Vallejo, uh, after the Peruvian poet Cesar Vallejo, who died, I think, 1929 or something. Uh, I, I kind of appropriated uh, uh, the, the first line of one of his poems. 
Um, but uh, there are a lot of Afro, Afro-Cuban references, a lot of references to traditional African culture as found in Cuba today. I, I, won't, um, I won't define them all for you. I, I think you can, you can get through the point without it if you don't know these references. After Vallejo. I will die in Havana in a hurricane. It will be morning. I'll be facing southwest, away from the Gulf, away from the storm, away from home, looking toward the virid hills of Matanzas, where the Orisha rise, lifted by congueros and masks of iron, bongoceros and masks of water, timbaleros and masks of fire, by all the clave that binds the rhythms of this world. I'll be writing when I go, revising another hopeful survey of my life. I will die of nothing that I did, but of all that I did not do. I promised myself a better self than I could make, and I will not forgive. You will be there complaining that I never saved you, that I left you where you live, stranded in your own green dream. When you come for me, come singing, no dirge, but scat my eulogy in bebop code. Sing that I died among gods, but lived with no god, but did not suffer for it. Find one true poem that I made and sing it to my shade as it fades into the wind. Sing it presto, in 4-4 time, in the universal ghetto key of B flat. I will die in Havana in rhythm. Tumbayo, Montuno, Guaguanco. Dense strata of rhythm pulsing me away and the mother of waters will say to the saint of crossroads, well, damn, he danced his way out after all. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Spelman. Please give these poets a round of applause. We, um, we, um, we, we're, we're, we're tight on time, so uh, I invite you, these poets, some of these poets will be around, and I'll be around, um, so we can, we can entertain a discussion a, l- a little bit later, and that's what this kind of day is made for. So uh, find the poets and, uh, and engage them in discussion. The one thing I did want to say, though, Ed, because I think this will, will kind of cohesive make it a cohesive, more cohesive thing, um, or to kind of bookend it, I should say, is that the folk idiom. That's what we heard here today in, in all of these poets, the folk idiom, where, where the artist puts their eye. The, uh, the artist puts their eye right where they are and the things that make them who they are, right where they are. And they talk about those things. And, they, and, and it's, not, it's not a matter of elevating them. It's just a matter of talking about them about making them plain. I like what you said, uh, 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 Mr. Spellman, about you know, Dr. Dr. Brown being very plain speaking. Mm. And I think that's the thing that made him such, a, such an icon and so important here in Washington, D.C., is because he was able to, to reach so many people um, with his work. It was accessible, and it was about people that we knew and people that we could connect with. So I invite you all to stick around and throughout the day and, and continue to connect, uh, connect with, with the poetry and, and the writers that are here today. Please give our, another round of applause for our writers here. Thank you very much. We invite you to take your seats for the next panel of two. We're going to call it a conversation because unfortunately our colleagues, Melissa Tucky and Reggie Kubiko, couldn't be with us this afternoon, this morning. So uh, we have, you have, 
with you today, myself. My name is Sarah Browning. I'm the executive director of Split This Rock. And this is my colleague and friend and comrade, Dan Vera, who's the, board of direct, who's the chair of the board of directors of Split This Rock. Dan is also an award-winning poet. His, first, his second book, Speaking Witty Witty, is the winner of the inaugural Letras Latinas Red Hen Prize for Poetry. So I'm very honored and pleased to be here with Dan and with all of you this morning to talk about how Dan and I both arrived in the city around the same time, 10, 12 years ago, and became possessed of this city and brought the spirit of this city, of the poetry of this city, to the national stage. Don't you hear this hammer ring? Gonna split this rock and split it wide. When I split this rock, stand by my side. That's a stanza from a poem by Langston Hughes called Big Buddy, from which we took the name for the organization Split This Rock. Contained within that short stanza is precisely the spirit of Washington, D.C. poetry that we wanted to share with our sisters and brothers around the country. Because the rock being split, we think of as the rock of injustice. Everything that stands in the way of the better world that we are working toward. Don't you hear this hammer ring? Gonna split this rock and split it wide. But when you split the rock, you need others by your side. When I split this rock, stand by my side. And it's that sense of community that poets need in order to sustain themselves in their artistry and in order to make a difference in our communities, in our nation, and in this benighted world in which we are creating our art and trying to live our lives. And so we were lucky, of course, in our brother and our uncle, Langston Hughes, who so often gives us the words we need as we build Split This Rock, the organization. And now Dan is going to tell you some of the origins of the group. Thanks, Sarah. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, this morning. Um, Split This Rock's DNA is, uh, can really be traced back um, I think in many ways to the earlier presentation, Sterling Brown, but certainly uh, other poets who lived in Washington, D.C., like Langston Hughes, um, who found a way of being um, involved politically and socially engaged uh, with their current events. Um, Split This Rock specifically, um, many of the same organizers, uh, many of the people kind of met each other um, at a, I think, a rather poetically historic event, and that was a, a reading that took place in 2003, um, it was in the run-up to the Iraq War uh, when people were really trying to find ways of being responsive. Um, for those who weren't here in the city at the time uh, and don't remember that, that history, um, what occurred was that the, um, the first lady of the, t of, of the time, um, Laura Bush, um, had called for a White House conference on poetry. Uh, specifically the poetry of three American poets, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, and Langston Hughes. And um, uh, invitations went out to a number of poets around the country, including Marilyn Nelson, who will be reading, um, reading here uh, at District of Lit later on today. And what um, the timing of that was very interesting because the conference, the call went forth, the invitation for these uh, participants went out um, and they arrived in the mailboxes of many of these poets, these invited poets, uh, the same, the morning after um, the president's de uh, address to the nation on the need to sort of go into, the, into Iraq, basically, um, uh, to go to war in Iraq. So that really jarred uh, many of the poets who received that, uh, that invitation, Sam Hamill, uh, Marilyn Nelson, and others. And um, what grew out of that was a call for poets uh, and poets to um, contribute poems and to respond to this White House invitation by gathering uh, a few poems. 
um, in response to um, you know, the idea of getting involved in Iraq. Um, something happened though, and that was that that email went viral and within a matter of weeks, there were thousands upon thousands of poems um, flooding in and Copper Canyon Press, um, which was a press run at the time by uh, Sam Hamill, um, was literally inundated, their servers collapsed. I mean, it was just kind of a, a nightmare. But what you had was, you basically had this message go around the country um, asking poets to sort of respond to this moment, this political moment. Um, and so the White House conference was canceled um, uh, with, with um, the word from, from the First Lady's office that poetry should not be politicized. Um, I, I just want to, I just want to reiterate, uh, the poetry of Langston Hughes not being politicized, uh, the poetry of Walt Whitman not being politicized. But anyway, so, so what happened was clearly there was energy that had um, been gathered and a call went forth to have readings around the country. And so there were readings scheduled uh, for a certain day, certain evening, and uh, it just so happened that uh, someone had just moved to the district, she's sitting to my right, um, and was interested in taking part in this, in this reading and kind of put the call out. And to keep the story short, we had close to 200 people uh, who gathered uh, that evening of the reading. I think it was one of the largest readings in the country. Um, many didn't know each other. Many were new to the city. I was, I'd, uh, I'd been in the city a few years myself. Uh, but it was also um, an amazing cross-section of the city's um, poetic communities. I say communities plural because it was uh, you know, race and gender and neighborhood and genre and it was, it was just an astounding evening of poetry and uh, clearly in some collective response to, um, to, to the political issue at hand. And Poets Against the War, um, which no longer kind of exists in any formal way, but had chapters around the country and the chapter in Washington DC uh, was by far the strongest. Uh, really found ways of sort of being engaged, making community across a number of issues, not just anti-war issues. Um, and it really led up after a number of years to a desire, after all these networks had been made, not only um, poets in, in Washington DC, but also poets around the country, a desire for some kind of festival. There are a number of poetry festivals around the country, um, but one that specifically spoke about uh, poetry and poetics of social engagement, uh, which had kind of gone to the wayside. It was sort of out of fashion. Um, but we really wanted to gather some of those people, and that led us to the planning for uh, the first Split This Rock Poetry Festival here in Washington, D.C. When we started thinking about doing something on a larger scale. It was precisely the history of Washington, D.C. poetry, some of which you've heard earlier of uh, the social engagement, especially in the African-American uh, poetry legacy, that we wanted, to, um, call, we wanted to bring poets from around the country to experience that. And uh, we looked around and there was no poetry festival here in Washington, D.C. There were many other wonderful things going on, but we didn't have a festival. And we started thinking about what it could be. And we didn't have an organization at that moment. D.C. Poets Against the War had always been an informal gathering of volunteer poet activists, literary activists. And um, I had imagined something that would last, but I knew I didn't want it to be against something. The marvelous poet activist Muriel Rukeyser, who had many ties to DC and we're celebrating her 100th, what would have been her 100th birthday this year. She says, yes, I protest, but every time I do, I want to make something, to plant something, to build something, to teach children, and that is, always been a guiding uh, principle for me that we are 
trying to imagine another world, that we are building a future, not just opposing the injustices that we see. And so um, I had never taken DC Poets Against the War into a formal thing, so we wanted to come up with another name and also wanted to invite poets who write on all kinds of social issues. Um, and of course, the intersection of so many of our social issues um, and social ills. Um, and so I, we started casting about for a name and it was extremely challenging, uh, but I had the great fortune to have the guidance of Ethelbert Miller, who has joined us this morning in the back, one of my mentors in this work. Um, I'm always grateful to him, who said, go back and read all of Langston Hughes's poetry from the 1930s. And that's where you'll find the most political of his poetry. It was a, a day long task. Some of it was a chore. Um, it's not all brilliant, but much of it is. And it was from that re reading that I found this poem called Big Buddy that Split This Rock is drawn from. And as soon as I brought it back to my colleagues and um, compatriots, they said, that is it. And we named the festival Split This Rock Poetry Festival Poems of Provocation and Witness. The other thing I learned from Ethelbert is that um, James Baldwin used to say there's a difference between a witness and an observer because a witness is called upon to testify. And so poetry of witness bears witness to injustice and provokes change. And that's where that twin poetry of provocation and witness came from. And we started from nothing except for the energy that we brought to the table and our vision. Um, but luckily, again, Ethelbert introduced us to the Institute for Policy Studies, the um, country's oldest progressive think tank, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. In fact, there's a huge celebration the weekend of Columbus Day weekend, um, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, sometime around there. I'm sorry, it's the, it's the long weekend, um, which you should all go to ips-dc.org to check out because it's going to be an amazing um, three days of um, discussions and thinking and imagining a better future uh, at IPS's 50th anniversary. And Ethelbert is the chair of the board there, and he invited, he talked those good folks into taking us on. And we moved into their offices and brought the rowdiness of the poets and um, began raising money through their sponsorship. And that has been an ongoing gift. We are now in our own organization, but we are still housed there. And it's an amazing partnership that we're very lucky to have. Um, so somehow, through the hard work of many, many um, activists, poets, we pulled together four days on the fifth anniversary of the war in Iraq of readings, workshops, panel discussions, walking tours. Kim Roberts, who's here and you'll hear from in a minute, organized a series of walking tours. Again, always introducing our out-of-town friends and many of our local friends to our own literary history. There was a Harlem Renaissance tour, a Walt Whitman in DC tour, and a gay and lesbian literary history in DC. Um, and so many people who visit our city don't know about the rich tradition and um, heritage here, don't know that the Harlem Renaissance in fact began in Washington, D.C. And so we get to taunt the New Yorkers when they come. Um, and so that has been central to our mission, is to honor our foremothers and fathers and always to recognize those upon whose shoulders we build this work. The first festival, um, all the poets we asked to read, to be featured, said yes, all of them. Um, and they waived their fees. And so um, Galway Cannell, Pulitzer Prize winner, Martina Espada, Naomi Shihab Nye, the list went on and on, 23 Mark poets. Mark Doty. Mark Doty. Um, way more than we anticipated <laughs> because they all said yes. They were so eager to be here in our nation's capital and speak out uh, for justice and for alternatives to war. And um, it was a remarkable four days. For the first time, poets who also think of themselves as activists after being out of favor 
in establishment poetry were welcomed home. And they found a home, some of them for the first time, especially folks who lived outside of big cities where there has always been this tradition. And um, they, several folks came up to me and said that they'd waited their whole lives for something like this. And to be celebrated and given a platform for them as activist poets, as poets trying to bring poetry to the center of public life, it was deeply transformative for them. And in the spirit of poetry that tries to imagine other things, I'm going to read an excerpt from a poem by Martin Espada. I'm sure many of you know it. He read it at the first festival. Mm. It's, and I can read the and, and, <laughs> and then Dan's going to read another piece. Um, this one is called Imagine the Angels of Bread. And I'm, uh, if you know it well, you'll hear that I'm skipping several stanzas because it is a somewhat long poem. Imagine the angels of bread. This is the year that squatters evict landlords, gazing like admirals from the rail of the roof deck or levitating hands in praise of steam in the shower. This is the year that dark-skinned men lynched a century ago return to sip coffee quietly with the apologizing descendants of their executioners. This is the year that the hands pulling tomatoes from the vine uproot the deed to the earth that sprouts that vine. This is the year that cockroaches become extinct, <laughs> that no doctor finds a roach embedded in the ear of an infant. If the abolition of slave manacles began as a vision of hands without manacles, then this is the year. If the shutdown of extermination camps began as imagination of a land without barbed wire or the crematorium, then this is the year. If every rebellion begins with the idea that conquerors on horseback are not many-legged gods, that they too drown if plunged in the river, then this is the year. So may every humiliated mouth, teeth like desecrated headstones, fill with the angels of bread. So as the, uh, that Espava poem points out, uh, the nice thing about Split This Rock was that it allowed poets to come together um, over, over a series of issues, poverty, uh, certainly warfare, um, gender exclusion. Um, Martin was at two of our festivals, has been at two of our, two of our festivals. And uh, I'm going to read a poem by Naomi Shiab Nye, who we've been honored to have at two of our festivals and a poem that really became viral um, after, after we got involved uh, in the Middle East again, um, and really talked about the, um, the exclusion and the targeting of people of Middle Eastern descent. Gate A4. Wandering around the Albuquerque airport terminal after learning my flight had been delayed for four hours, I heard an announcement if anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate A4 was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing loudly, help, said the flight service person. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late, and she did this. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke to her haltingly. Shadoa, shubiduk, habibti, stani shwe min fadlik, shubid siwi. The minute she heard any word she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, no, we're fine. 
You'll get there just later. Who's picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son, and I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane and would ride next to her, southwest. <laughs> she talked to him. Then we called her other sons just for the fun of it. Then we called my dad, and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, they had 10 shared friends. <laughs> then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took up about two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar, crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts out of her bag, and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. There is no better cookie. And then the airline broke out free beverages from huge coolers, and two little girls from our flight ran around serving us all apple juice, and they were covered with powdered sugar, too. And I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves, such an old country tradition, always carry a plant, always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around the gate of late and weary ones, and I thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all of the other women, too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. That was Naomi Shihab Nye. And the poem I read was by Martina Spada. Much of their, yay. Much of their work is available online. Um, they each have many wonderful books, so I urge you all to read more uh, if you haven't. When I first saw my, Naomi read, it was several years before Split This Rock, and she was reading, I don't know if any of you were there, at the National uh, Women's Museum of the Arts, and her heart filled the whole auditorium. And it reminded me of the community that we had built among ourselves um, and that was here in the poetry community of Washington, D.C. And I thought, well, that is what I want, uh, Split This Rock, which was there just a twinkle in our eyes, uh, to be. And so we've been honored that Naomi has joined us twice. It's the poets um, supporting one another. And um, it's not that we don't feel jealous when Dan wins a prize. But the jealousy always is overshadowed by the great joy and the pride that we feel for, feel for one another. And I have felt that ever since I arrived in Washington, D.C. and was welcomed here. And I feel so lucky that to have landed in a place that my whole life was leading toward, this community across lines of race and class and sexual orientation and physical ability and, that, and poetic style which uh, sadly often divides us more than any other thing. The performance poets, the literary poets, the experimental poets, the narrative poets. And so always in um, DC Poets Against the War and since then in Split This Rock, we have tried to unite these poets together on the same stage. So every event that we organize, we try to have poets of all these different styles and it's to represent the full diversity of, the, of our city and of our nation. And for too long, official poetry has not done that. And Split This Rock has played a role in knocking down the doors so that now poets like Dan, uh, all sorts of poets of all races, ethnicities, again, um, sexual orientations, are now winning major prizes and being published and reading at major 
events and festivals around the country, and Split This Rock has played a role in opening those doors. There's a long way to go until poetry tells the full American story, official poetry. The poets are writing the poems, but it's reaching that broad audience, building the readership. And so at the first festival, when people said to us, no, you can't stop. This, you've only just begun. We took that as our marching orders. And we organized Split This Rock into an organization, the, all the mess of, of a board of directors and applying for nonprofit status. And we have now staged three festivals. The fourth, the plans uh, we're gearing up for right now is March 27th to the 30th, 2014. And there are flyers out in the lobby. Uh, the festival will be featuring Sheila Black, Franny Choi, Eduardo de Corral, Gail Danley, Natalie Diaz, Joy Harjo, Yusuf Komenyaka, Maria Melendez, Dunya McHale, Shilja Patel, Wang Ping, Claudia Rankin, Tim Siebels, Myris Glaru, Dines Smith, and Anne Waldman. So another fabulous lineup, and um, I hope you'll join us. We also uh, have a vast and creative youth program. Two years ago, the DC Youth Slam team came to us, maybe three, uh, without, without, the Slam team had been around for 20 years, but they didn't, no longer had an institutional home. And they came to Split This Rock and asked if we would take on the team, and we said yes. And the program has grown since then and now uh, runs after school poetry clubs in 20 high schools in DC and Maryland. And we partner with the, a group that does the same in Virginia and puts on a, uh, a weekend long competition of these high school teams called Louder Than a Bomb every spring at George Washington University. Also, the DC Youth Slam team this year came in second in the nation out of 50 teams. We, other programs include a contest, a national poetry contest. We're now in the seventh year of that contest, and Tim Siebels, who will be featuring at the festival, will be judging it. The deadline is coming up November 1st, so any poets in the house? Send your poems. It's a fundraiser for Split This Rock. All right. Poets in the house. Um, there's flyers for that on the table as well. And we are very excited that we are launching a new program this year the Freedom Plow Award for Poetry and Activism. And it is uh, a national award that we'll be giving for the first time also on November 1st. And there's a Save the Date flyer out in the hall for that event, which will be at the Goethe Institute on 7th Street in Chinatown. Um, and um, Ethelbert was one of the judges, Martha Collins and Carlos Andres Gomez were the judges this inaugural year. And I'm very excited to announce in public for the first time the winner of that award. Her name is Eliza Griswold. And she traveled to Afghanistan and collected two line folk poems from Afghani women called Landes. And the Landes were published by the Poetry Magazine. And they're forthcoming in a book that will be published next spring. And she did this um, sometimes in very difficult under very difficult and threatening circumstances, kind of going underground to collect these poems. And the poems are remarkable. Some of them are ancient. Some of them are brand new. But they're traded as a kind of underground language of resistance by Afghan women. And it's an incredible um, project. She collaborated with a photographer who went with her and took stunning pictures. So I hope you'll join us. Eliza Griswold will be coming to receive the award and will read some of her own poetry and some of the land days, and I hope we'll be able to see slides of the photographs. And that is November 1st. We're going to read a couple of our own poems. We're going to have a question and answer in just a minute. We're going to um, read a couple of our own poems in the spirit of Split This Rock. Um, and then Dan's going to end with a Neruda poem, and then we'll have conversation. How's that sound? Good. So in the... Um, I have a poem that speaks direct, and so why don't we do round up and I'll do one, okay. you'll do one. Great. So um, I have a poem that talks, uh, describes one of these events that's kind of um, split this rocky, but um, 
but that Fred Joyner organized. Is Fred still here? Yay. So I dedicate it to Fred. Um, it's called After Poetry and Photographs in an Anacostia Gallery. Girls age 10 read poetry. We applaud wildly, read our own poems, drink lemonade, eat cheese, carve one evening of possibility in the muggy Washington night as portraits of a neighborhood forsaken stare down from the gallery walls. Driving home across the river, on the off-ramp, I spot him and just swerve, a man there, teetering, so thin. Quickly he is gone behind me. The world comes to us like this, yes and no on the same evening. At the end of the reception, a young man appears beside me with a paper cup. I have not seen his swollen face before. I fill his cup with lemonade. He eats some cheese and some more. No one asks him to leave. I'd, I'd like to add that was an American Poetry Museum event, mm -hmm. so I want to to thank John Westbay and shout out to him as well. Uh, so a um, poem I'm going to read um, is a poem rooted in my uh, discovery of the city. I, uh, my background, uh, my parents came from Cuba in 1962, and I was born in South Texas, so that makes me a little weird. Um, but anyway, I, I moved here and, uh, like many people, uh, looked at a tourist map and was kind of stunned to find a little marker uh, down in um, East Potomac Park. And it took me a couple of years to get down there, but this is, uh, I guess, uh, this is a ekphrastic poem uh, about this monument. The Cuban Friendship Urn, and the epigraph is the inscription. The memory of the Maine will last forever through the centuries, as will the bonds of friendship between Cuba and the United States of North America. <clears throat> Graceful lines in relief portray a goddess of liberty beside the mast of the majestic ship lying battered in the waters of Havana Harbor. This is the Cuban friendship urn, gift from the Machado government to commemorate the ties that bound and bind the memory of the sinking that led to the war that led to the liberation, that led to the occupation, that led to the revolution, that led to where we are. Far away from the prying eyes of tourists to the capital city, or anyone who might discover how friendship, even etched in stone, can leave awkward silences in history. This is why the urn now stands majestically beneath an overpass, beside a parking lot, behind Jefferson's enormous shoulder. This is how we commemorate the history of a friendship between two nations bound together irreparably in the wreckage of history. Great. So one of the things I'm, I'm most appreciative about um, Split This Rock and really kind of the greater Washington um, writing community and poetry community is that it really allows you to, um, to pay attention and to contemple uh, your surroundings. Um, as I said recently to somebody, you know, I, I, I can't imagine another city where you're confronted with our national history, but also our national uh, I mean, specifically, our nat I guess our identity in a lot of ways, our conflicted identity. And so to be able to sort of be with other writers and, and hear other writers uh, struggle with that is, is just incredibly enriching um, to the work. So I'm going to close with a poem um, that I wrote after uh, there's a big writers conference every year called AWP. And it was in Washington, D.C. in 2011. And for that conference, Split This Rock put on a tribute to Langston Hughes. And I was going to um, 
be chairing that panel and with Sonia Sanchez and Jericho Brown and Derek Weston Brown, one of our lo um, strong local poets, we were Brown, Brown, Browning, and Sanchez. <laughs> uh, and I said, we, we were in a funeral parlor because uh, Hughes's legacy was a living one. Um, that was my bad joke, but uh, um, uh, Kim Roberts lent me um, a book about Langston Hughes. It was a sort of chronology of his life. And I learned some things I hadn't known, including um, a fact that opens the poem that I'm gonna read here. Um, when he joined the Merchant Marine in 1923, it's, an, uh, it's speculated that that might have been one of the first times he had a sexual experience with a man. Um, and he, he also did the following, um, which is in the first stanza of the poem. So that inspired this poem. Langston Hughes joins the Merchant Marine, 1923. Well, for the young people, I want you to know that the book that's mentioned in the first stanza is called Leaves of Grass. It's by Walt Whitman, who um, many people consider kind of the, the grandpapa of American poetry. And he lived here in Washington, DC for 10 years during and after the Civil War. Uh, he was also a gay man. Langston Hughes joins the Merchant Marine, 1923. Langston drops all his books, except leaves of grass, into New York Harbor, so that the two poets lie down together in the cramped hold of the ship, wrapped in the hammock of language, song of themselves spooning in the middle of the ocean. Uncle Walt whispers to Langston out on the blue, cajoles, welcomes him, stretching vocal cords, straining body, ship, men, hunger. Langston touches and is touched, ship sheen of the other, skin the question, skin the answer, no land but music. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll just close with a, a, a poem that's kind of led me. This is uh, Pablo Neruda. I'll, it's very short, and I'll, in Spanish, it's, Si cada día cae dentro de cada noche, existe un pozo donde la claridad está impresionado. Tenemos que sentarnos a la orilla del pozo de la oscuridad y pescar por luz caída con paciencia. If each day falls inside each night, there exists a well where clarity lies imprisoned. We must sit at the rim of the well of darkness and fish for fallen light with patience. I believe a lot of the work that Split This Rock does uh, is doing that kind of fishing. Um, are there any questions? Thank you, Karen. Did everybody hear that? Dennis Brutus was uh, a, a South African yeah. poet and writer um, and activist who had been imprisoned on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela during apartheid. And he was featured at our first festival. Thank you for that reminder. Um, and he described how the, his jailer, their jailers put them to work splitting rocks from one pile to the next for no reason except to split rocks. Um, a year later, uh, Dennis passed away. So it was quite um, moving and powerful that he'd been here with us. There's a woman who's been waiting patiently here and then I saw you there, okay? I just wondered where the festival will be held. I don't see the venue on the flyer. Yes. Sure. 
Thank you. Um, the festival will be held at the National Geographic um, headquarters in their auditorium, and then uh, there will be a number of daytime activities um, in that area. It's kind of a two-block radius, two, three blocks. For the first three festivals, we were in the U Street neighborhood, um, which was fantastic to celebrate that history, that literary history there. Um, but it, uh, there was no good auditorium in the U Street neighborhood that's the right size, and so it was a constant source of frustration. Um, this year, we've moved it all downtown, so that we'll be at National Geographic, but then um, we'll be able to celebrate the national uh, social justice organizations that are there right nearby um, that do good work because they are sponsoring and, and housing the rest of the festival. So uh, the Wilderness Society, the AFL-CIO um, so far, and uh, also the Sumner School, which of course is got a rich history in Washington, D.C. So we'll be, and, and we're working on a couple of other places. So that's exciting, thank you, yes. What inspired you to start writing? What inspired us to start writing? <laughs> You're first. I'm inspired first. Um, Dan um, inspired me. You know, I, I first started writing, um, it was the lead up to the first uh, Iraq war back in, oh goodness. 91. 19, yeah, 1991. Um, and uh, for me, it was kind of a way of expressing um, to myself privately, uh, what I was sort of struggling with, you know, what was happening. I was in college, so I was, yeah, it was uh, my final years in college uh, in, in central Texas uh, in a very conservative part of this country where people weren't really talking about it, even though everybody my age were, you know, directly connected to it. So it was a way that I, um, you know, I was able to make some sense of it. Um, that's when I started writing. And then I, you know, from that just kind of continue writing, but really started reading quite a bit. I think that's, that's a really good thing for poets to do, read, read other poets, read, read more poetry. So. Yeah, my story is the same, just everything that was pounding up inside me, I had to get it out. And so I started writing, and I found my way to poetry. I was nine. Uh, but then, um, but I didn't really, I, and then I wrote some in, in high school, and I wrote some in college, even though I thought, keep thinking, kept thinking I wasn't gonna be a writer, I was gonna be a community organizer. Um, so, but I kept find, so I was an American history major because I wanted to learn the, what had gotten us in this mess that we were in at that moment. Uh, but I, I, couldn't, I kept finding myself in creative writing workshops. I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> and then finally, um, many years later, I, started, I really put poetry at the center of my life. But I was, it was, I was 30 before I started writing really seriously. You're next. Ever have students in the contest? Are there students in the contest? Well, you know what, we have, a, we have a contest for students called The World and Me, and it's every spring. And if the teachers uh, take my card afterward, we'll make sure that you get information about how to submit to it, okay? That one's free. The adult one is a, poet, is a contest, um, costs $20 to enter, because it's a fundraiser for Split This Rock. So you want to enter the free one. I think. About our immigration, borders, all kinds of borders, astral, you know, Diane and I had swimming from Cuba to, to Key West or wherever, yeah. you know. Um, I'm wondering if you have any linkages to other parts of the world, poets who, are dealing with immigration and borders and whatever are called illegals. Uh, yeah, very, uh, very, very much so. Uh, in fact, this um, uh, Saturday, uh, one of the events that we co-sponsored uh, was an inter international um, effort of so poetry and social justice. It was uh, 10,000 poets for change. 100, 100. Sorry, 100,000 was more, many more thousands than I knew. Um, 100,000 poets for change, and um, we had Eduardo Coral, uh, who will be featured at the March uh, reading. Uh, Eduardo grew up um, on the Arizona border, and specific, he was, uh, his significance is he was the first Latino to win the um, Yale Younger Series Poetry Prize, which is probably the most prestigious first book prize. That was the first in like over 100 years or something. So it's, um, but anyway, Eduardo, was, his work has been specifically dealing with the dreamers 
um, who have really been um, you know, pushing the issue of immigration reform. And, um, but they're, you know, that's, that's the most recent. Uh, we certainly have had, you know, we always try to have international uh, poets at every festival and um, you know, the uh, really finding ways of connecting to poets who are not only speaking of kind of immigration, but also the, the, the refugee status of the millions of people who are currently um, not only in the United States, but also struggling internationally around issues of, of migration and movement and uh, refugees. Again, all of the art issues inextricably linked. War drives so many people to leave their homelands, as does poverty, or then they come here and face poverty. So it's uh, poetry can link, can make these linkages sometimes in ways that PowerPoints don't do quite as effectively. We have more questions over here. There's a young man in front who hasn't asked a question yet. How much time do you all spend writing a day or in a week? <laughs> that one comes to me. Well, you know, before I started DC Poets Against the War and Split This Rock, I tried to write four times a week. I tried to work part-time. I tried to organize my life so I could do that and live cheaply. Uh, but nowadays, no. Um, nowadays I write um, maybe twice a month. But then I go away. My family is very kind to me, as is my board of directors. And they let me take time off, and I go to a wonderful place called Virginia Center for the Creative Arts which is organized to give writers and artists and composers time away from their daily lives. And they feed you. <sighs> it's amazing. Since I'm the cook in my house, this is like the big deal. Um, and so I go there and I write. And then I also look back at everything I've written over the past year, and I type it up, and I see what's there for a poem. Yeah. I. Um... In a way, I'm writing all the time, because I always try to have a book with me, um, kind of very old school in that way. Um, I, I always you know, take notation about um, what's happening, but also kind of whatever I'm researching, um, something that you know, some thought may kind of enter in that I want to dedicate more time to um, later on. Um, I, I, too, have enjoyed uh, and appreciated having the chance to sort of like go away, and I'm, I'm actually October, in October, I'll be gone for three weeks at a residency. So to have kind of dedicated time to just write. Um, and uh, that's, that's a tremendous uh, opportunity for writers to, to do writing. Uh, I'm also in a writer's group, which is also really uh, helpful. The writer's groups are um, made up of usually four or five poets, or, or if you're writing fiction or some other genre. And we meet once a month. And so um, I know that I have a deadline once a month that I have to bring poems to that writer's group. And that sort of you know, gives me a good, good deadline, good target to sort of write towards. So. We have time for just uh, yes, like homework, yes, exactly. two more questions. <laughs> oh, but this young woman hasn't asked a question yet. So would you like? OK, and then maybe you guys can combine your question back there. And we'll try to be quick with our answers. Yes. Yeah. My question is, would you have any favorite authors that opened your mind a bit more to poetry? Uh, yeah, for me, it was uh, uh, the poet that I sort of recited, Pablo Neruda. Um, yes, I, that, little, that moment in, have you seen The Wizard of Oz, where the, the house lands, and suddenly it's black and white, and then she walks out, and it's all color, technicolor? When I read Pablo Neruda, I like to say that I was, I was Dorothy coming into The Wizard of Oz, and everything kind of went glorious technical. Uh, but it led me to other authors. Um, Neruda's a, a big one for me. Um, there's so many other uh, poets. Um, I'll, I'll mention Lucille Clifton, yeah. who was very important to this area, the DC, um, Maryland, Virginia area. She was a poet laureate of Maryland for many years and taught at St. Mary's College, and she passed away a couple of years ago. Her work is quite brilliant, and the poems are very short. She can pack an enormous amount into a short poem, 
And so it's a great um, exercise in reading her work to think about all the worlds she opens with just a few words. She was very important to me. Okay, y'all, you're on and then we're done. What advice would you give aspiring writers who wants to become professional writers? What advice would we give to aspiring writers? Come out to poetry events? Read poetry? Like a book? They're fantastic. They fit in your pocket. Or on your screen. You can take them anywhere. There is a lot online, but you know what? Sometimes it's overwhelming. You say, Give me a good poem and you get a hun you know, 1.5 million hits. How do you know what's a good poem, what's an interesting poem? So there are fantastic anthologies, collections of poetry. And if you, uh, if you go to Busboys and Poets Books, they have a lot of the great ones um, that can lead you to many different authors. So reading poetry, listening to it, sharing poems with your friends. I, I you know, um, I, I certainly, I agree about kind of reading other poets and other writing. But think for a moment that when you come across something that you really love, something that somebody's written, it's because that person took the time to sort of wrestle and put it down. And that person implicitly decided to uh, disregard the idea that your life doesn't matter, you know, that your own story shouldn't be on the page. And because of that, you're you know, you have the benefit of their writing. And I, I think that's one of the things the writer has to sort of kind of break past that and, and pay attention, observe, and bear witness to your own life and your own struggles and find some way to sort of like be honest about it on the page. I don't know, that's kind of, that's but great. yeah, it's like there, there's, a, there's a promise that's happening when you read something that you really like. Um, and, and the promise is that you, um, they paid attention and they recorded it and they made you laugh or they made you cry. Um, and, and so if, if, if you feel moved to sort of do that, then, then you wanna like extend the promise, I guess. You wanna extend the, um, the gift in a way, uh, pay it forward. But every, all of our lives are beautiful and rich and all of our lives have stories to tell. In, whether in poetry or in story. On that note, I want to say thank you all very much. I hope, and I, a big thank you to the organizers of District of Literature who've done an extraordinary thing today. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.